Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I'm going to continue to talk about corruption, but corruption from the global perspective. I want to understand <coughs> the very structure of the global economy uh, <coughs> to grasp how corruption spreads and what can be done to control corruption. As far as I am concerned, I think it, corruption has become a global phenomenon. It's not just confined to one country or one place, one town or one island or what have you. It's become a global phenomenon. In order to understand its global spread, we will have to really look at the way it, <coughs> capitalism has organized itself at the global level. It is not, uh, if you just look at uh, corruption or capitalism as it works within a country, within India for instance, you will not be able to grasp how, <coughs> you know, how pervasive corruption is and how difficult it, will, it is for us to tackle the problem of corruption. We can say that so and so is corrupt. So, you know, this place, you know, this particular corporation is corrupt or this particular individual is corrupt or there is a, you know, politicians are hand in glove with, you know, the <coughs> businessmen who, in the, who indulge in corruption and so on and so forth. We can talk, cry horse about, uh, uh, <coughs> about crony capitalism and all that. But if you want to really, you know, look, mitigate corruption, we just have to have to look at the global structure, global network that has spread itself, which enables, you know, corruption to thrive. <coughs> so in the, by the way, I said mitigate corruption. I did not say eliminate corruption for the simple reason that I think it's a very difficult task even to mitigate corruption, let alone eliminate it. Of course, in the problem is how do you define corruption? You know, in, in ethical terms, you, if you talk, talk about corruption in ethical terms, it is uh, any wrongdoing on the part of individuals or the state which is you know, which causes a big loss for the <coughs> loss of public resources and for loss for the whole nation. But legally speaking, corruption is defined by, you know, in different governments, you know, in different ways. That's also part of the problem of tackling corruption. But in India, in some countries, you know, the uh, bribe giver is not uh, you know, in India, for instance, the bribe giver is, is not spared. He is equally guilty of corruption as the bribe taker. In some countries, the <coughs> bribe taker, you know, is held guilty. And in some countries, it is also the <coughs> case that in some countries, there are whistleblowers and whistleblowers are given the rights to expose corruption and they are given protection. So that they uh, they are not uh, <clears throat> they don't come to harm by <coughs> vested interests who want to cover up on corruption. So it's a you know problem. Legally speaking, it's a problematic issue. But today, I think I should think that any wrongdoing on the part of businesses or government or <coughs> or in collusion with the or uh, <coughs> on the part of both of them teaming together um, to 
you know, um, unethically <coughs> draw public resources for private gain, I, I should think that is corruption. This is a very broad definition, but uh, it does not really matter to me at this stage that uh, you know this is a very broad and broad definition because I think the point I am trying to focus on more is on the social structure of corruption today. Social structure, global social structure that has <coughs> emerged. <coughs> And this social structure of corruption is, uh, you know, is a very interesting social structure where the leg legitimate and illegitimate act uh, activities sort of, you know, get overlapped. And it's very difficult to distinguish where legitimacy begins, where legitimacy ends, and illegitimate activities or illegal activities, you know. <clears throat> begin. So, this is my purpose <coughs> in this lecture to elaborate the social global social structure of corruption. Now, uh, having said that, let me start with one simple example. You have we have all heard of Swiss banks, commercial banks in Switzerland, and they are regarded as the source of as a fount of global corruption. Now, of course, there are other uh, financial institutions which have come up, which are <coughs> known to be, um, which have become much more notorious, whereas the government of Switzerland is now coming to, you know, is now <coughs> trying to cooperate with other countries to ensure that illegal funds do not flow into it, you know, even if illegal funds flow into the, the, those banks, the people who are indulging in uh, corrupt activities are exposed and their uh, accounts are exposed. Uh, the, and the details of how much money they have in their accounts are exposed. You see, usually Swiss banks uh, accounts, savings accounts are uh, secret accounts. They cannot, nobody can, uh, that is the reason why many people are attracted to put money in Swiss bank accounts, Swiss banks, because you cannot trace, you cannot, nobody can know uh, who you are who has put that money. And Swiss banks, when you put the money in their banks, you have to give them a fee to keep the <clears throat> keep the money in the in the bank, and then the banks use that money to invest and make big profits. So you know the banks gain both ways. So in looking at this, you know the Swiss banks. What about uh, the Swiss? You know, Swiss banks not only you know they became famous, they became very rich, and they enriched. Uh, uh, the, the tiny country of Switzerland, which was neutral during the World War, this is World War II, because many of the Jewish victims of uh, <coughs> the Nazi regime, they had their account, they had transferred their accounts to Swiss banks, and then they died in the Holocaust. Many of them died, and most of those <coughs> accounts which were which which were unclaimed that uh, enriched the coffers of the of the of switzerland so the point is and then swiss, swiss banks are you know doing this repeatedly so what happens is all the you know uh, <coughs> uh, you know corrupt politicians you know wherever they are in the world they when they have amassed money they find for instance uh, the french president marcos is supposed to have done that and many um, african dictators are supposed to have transferred big big amounts of money into swiss bank uh, swiss bank accounts all that you have to do is to they give you a secret number all that you have to do is to remember the secret number and you can transact uh, you can withdraw or you can send money from from those swiss bank accounts to anywhere in the world on just a, on, the, on the basis of just a phone call so that is the <clears throat> what shall i say the 
big magic that uh, of Swiss banks. And uh, it's also reported that several, uh, there have been come, you know, newspaper reports coming out that uh, several um, Indian businessmen and uh, politicians also have their accounts in Swiss banks, although they are not verified. Now, uh, Switzerland is just one instance. Let me give you an example of uh, how, uh, you know, but uh, actually talking of Swiss banks, we should keep in mind one thing. Swiss, Switzerland banks are all legitimate legal entities. They are not illegal activities. All right, you know, you can complain about Hawala transactions. All right, I'll, I'll discuss Hawala if I have the, you know, subsequently. Hawala, right away I can mention this. Hawala transactions refer to illegal transfer of money from one country to another uh, without going through the um, central bank, you know, financial authorities of the country. This can e easily be done by, you know, you give, you know, you have a relative uh, abroad to whom you want to send money uh, <coughs> or your relative wants to send money to you. You go to a, it's a kind of an informal bank. In, informally, there's, there's a person who will collect the money from you and then sends a message to one of your relatives uh, send, say, send the money to one of your relatives or friends, whoever it is, you know, through a, con through a contact within the country, all right? The cash is sent, uh, sent to that person and nobody, the government will not come to know how much you have, you know, uh, sent across. That means that you don't have to pay, you know, you, you're not, you, that, that money that you have earned abroad is unaccountable. If there are, uh, you know, is unaccountable, you don't have to pay income tax on that. Uh, perhaps you might have avoided the income, paying income tax in the other country. And you may, uh, you know, you, the person who receives the money may, you know, doesn't, you know, if it's a company or if it's a private person who has sold something, all right, the, he has to pay taxes here in the country. He can avoid that because it it will never come in the books. That that is hawala transaction. I'm not talking about or for instance, you know, there are transactions, there are illegal transactions to you know in gun you know gun trade. All right, there are illegal transactions for narcotics, narcotics and gun trade and terrorist networks are all widespread. You know, there are you know <coughs> huge amounts of uh, uh, currency money flowing from one part of the world to the other to encourage uh, <clears throat> this thing, terrorist activities, you know, uh, to support uh, this narcotics uh, smuggling and all that. I'm not going into that as it. That itself, that network itself is difficult to <clears throat> break, up, break up. And even then, you know, it is, once you identify them, there is a kind of a, you know, what shall I say, the, the, the governments can take, you know, a police action to eliminate them. But I'm talking about uh, the legal structures that have come up globally, which felicitate or facilitate uh, corrupt activities. Now so I said Switzerland, you know, Swiss banks is one uh, are one institution that um, uh, are a conduit to cor corruption money. Uh, I'll give you se several other examples. For instance, you know this um, when you're talking about corruption, uh, it's like this. There are several uh, activities that uh, corporations can engage in to make money, you know, in an unfair manner. Those activities are not regarded really as corrupt activities, but they are unethical activities. And because they are unethical activities, I think <coughs> we should also highlight them because looking at the, you know, legitimate corporate sector, and its practices, there are very many 
practices that the corporations, private corporations pursue, which uh, you know raise doubts about their activities. There many of them are some already reputed big, you know, reputed multinational corporations uh, of gigantic size, but uh, they indulge in practices which are not really ethical. The point that I am stressing on ethics is when once you give up your hold on ethics, then it is easy to slip into those activities which are regarded as corrupt. I think those activities per se should be, you know, even though they are uh, they only flout ethical norms, they should be regarded as uh, corrupt practices really. For instance, you know, I can uh, talk about, uh, you know, you have all heard of uh, this Apple. Apple company, computer company, is famous for its iPhones and its uh, <coughs> its computers. It's become famous, with, you know, uh, thanks to Steve Jobs, who has who set up this big company. It's a fantastically, you know, innovative company, which it has given employment to so many IT designers, you know, the and programmers through the through the application of apps as it's called, but uh, newspaper reports say that uh, uh, the uh, you know Apple company indulged in uh, uh, deliberately slowing down some of their iPhones so that people will give them up and buy new the, the pro, that programmed these iPhones in such a way that they deliberately slow down after some time so that people will you know abandon those phones and go for the later later models of phones so this is you know this is from a company which is supposed to have uh, had high ethical standards even in procurement of their materials and in their sales ethics you know they would uh, be the first ones to accept uh, any fault in their programs any fault in their <coughs> you know <clears throat> products and they are known to be perfectionists and uh, this is one this in this one instance you know you can be, you can say that this is just one instance but uh, if companies you know do these kinds of you know get into uh, get involved in these kinds of shortcuts there is no knowing to what extent they can descend and uh, how you know they can their activities can slip into corruption you see there is a another a phrase which corporations use that's called the that is called plausible deniability you see many of the corporations indulge in activities which are shady activities but they can uh, they have evi such evidence that you can say that you know if if you are caught if the, if you are caught you can say no 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 there is you know uh, i didn't do it you know this is uh, how can you you know say that i prove that i can uh, that i have done it because there is not enough evidence to you know actually you know sort of catch hold of them with strong evidence this is uh, you see for instance uh, let me tell you there is a there is a big company called multinational company called uh, one of the big multinational companies i don't want to name the name of the company which was uh, uh, discovered to have been indulging in big frauds uh, in in a big way huge fraud which affected several shareholders and others you know in a very big way this company what it did was it somehow faked accounts you know forged accounts to hide the fact that it was uh, making losses it consistently you know it's through the help of accountants it created the impression that the company was making profits and uh, year by year these profits kept increasing then uh, and then it, it the the company reported you know they had to report annually to the 
authority, the regulatory authority about their, they have to give their balance sheets and all that. And you know, they gave all accurate data with a flood of data they gave, gave to these, uh, to the regulatory authorities and the regulatory authorities could not catch them. Then one fine morning, what uh, the chief executives of the company did was to sell off the shares that they had in their company and uh, walk away from the company. And then when they, when they sold off the shares at a high price, then uh, the company realized that their shares you know, tanked because the company realized that they were all, all along in, the, in, the, you know, in big debt and they were all along making losses and these losses did not come into, you know, uh, come into public notice and uh, the chief executives of the company you know, ran away with uh, you know, millions of dollars. You know, this happens because in these companies there is this pra practice of sharing, <coughs> of uh, you know, rewarding your uh, you know, chief executive, your big executives, top executives with uh, stock options. Instead of giving them bonus, they give you a part of the share of the company, you know, some, some portion of the shares of the company. So it's in their interest to ensure that the shares, share value of the company keeps increasing, you know, even if uh, they adopt fraudulent means. So this is one clear example. I think this is corruption. This is, you know, uh, unethical practice. And, uh, you know, quite often that, um, you know, there are several other uh, types of eth eth unethical practices one can, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> look at. Now, what happens with these unethical practices is, now, uh, companies regard that, you know, they, in their interest for ensuring high profits, they not only, they have resorted to very legal techniques of, um, you know, ensuring that they pay less taxes to the government one of the things they one of the things they do is that uh, they open their headquarters in um, areas in countries where their the corporate tax is zero or they, there's no they those uh, you know national governments of those countries do not uh, you know impose any tax any corporate tax you know, with the specific intention of encouraging such companies to come and park their funds, you know, in the, with them. That will give them, you know, that will increase their tourism sector and more, more footfalls in on their country, means more more foreign exchange, you know, would flow into this, in their country and so on. So what happens is that many very reputed companies, huge, you know, mega companies of the world have, uh, you know, report that their headquarters is in countries where they don't, they don't have to pay tax. By this means, what they do is they avoid paying taxes where their uh, products are sold, where their employees are employed, all right, in large numbers, and uh, they completely avoid uh, giving, you know, taxes. This means they are, uh, with, you know, they are uh, actually, you know, uh, denying the tax that a country in which their activities are prominent, uh, you know, <coughs> in, in countries where they are, they are actually located and they are working, you know, there, the, you know, they, for those governments, they would, uh, they don't have to pay taxes, all right. Now, this kind of a system of uh, not, not you know is also used for uh, you know <clears throat> transferring funds from one country to another you have all heard of uh, the various islands that have become places you know this is these islands have uh, become notorious for uh, you know ensuring that funds are transferred from one country to another, funds are transferred in such a manner that ultimately 
you will not find you will not you'll find it extremely difficult to trace who is the you know who are the real people who are the people who really you know got hold of the money you know got the money back you see for instance uh, we in india we have all heard of the bofors you know corrupt bofors deal in bofors deal this was the problem the money that was transferred abroad got uh, you know it uh, they were transferred abroad to what are called shell companies shell companies or companies only on paper they don't really exist five or six names six people can come together those those uh, companies have such easy legal laws easy laws that five or seven six you know seven people can come together and set up a company and give it a name in a particular room in several of these islands the a single room uh, uh, the address of one single room in a <coughs> building you know is given for uh, the is given for uh, as the has the headquarters of numerous companies all right and once you set up the company you transfer funds to that company in the, you know to the bank in that company in that uh, island you know in the name of that company and when that comes that company <coughs> opens up you know other companies in other countries in other islands and they transfer those funds to those other islands they give the different names or give you know uh, uh, of directors of those companies and so on the uh, and then that that company again in turn so you know passes the funds to yet another company and in this process you know the funds are dispersed in such a manner that uh, you know this what is what's called it's, it's it's a kind of a benami operation you will you know in the names of different people who would all come together you know uh, which actually the all the funds may go to one or two or three you know big people so this way the funds are transferred this is called this is called laundering money laundering all right black money is laundered into white money black money is money that is uh, that has escaped taxation income tax corporate tax all right wealth tax from different countries and are parked in these islands and uh, these islands transfer money to other companies and maybe they transfer money back to the companies within india and uh, those companies say claim that this is legitimate uh, transfer of funds for the export of certain goods that uh, we know uh, the, for for the goods that we exported in a particular year so it is quite uh, you know is the entire network you know is quite murky and dense these networks are so dense and murky that uh, you know uh, <coughs> It, it, that all the transactions become opaque and it will not be possible for uh, uh, people for authorities to detect where the money has flown you see this is one of the major problems that our present government is facing the present government are, you know promised that they will bring back uh, black money from abroad and that if they bring bring back the black money we don't have to may, many all of us don't have to pay there's so much of black money all of us don't have to pay any taxes for the next you know 5 to 10 years but it turns out that it's a very difficult uh, difficult exercise to bring back the money because it's you don't you don't know where it is you know in which accounts these these you know funds are actually parked so it is uh, you know it, uh, what is very tragic is that many of the companies which are known for their integrity and for their ethics have been caught out as indulging in these unethical corrupt practices now this problem of uh, c corruption is also uh, 
you know becomes excessive, it, it corruption spreads or right across the world for yet another reason. Our economy, you know, today the one major difference between the capitalism of the even the 20th century and today's capitalism is the role of the finance, finance capital. I will have to explain this in a little detail. Finance capital refers to, um, you see, there are, when you are talking about flow of funds for investment, there are two ways in which the funds are invested. One is by, you know, in direct foreign investment, in our country direct foreign investment. Direct foreign investment is very clear to understand. It's very, you know, um, there is. We have, for instance, this program of Make in India. We, we claim that uh, uh, foreign direct investment has increased enormously since we announced this program. That means that foreign companies have come to India. Our, you know. Uh, the ease of doing business in, in India has jumped 20, the, the index of ease of doing business in India has jumped to some 30 points. Now uh, that means that foreign co companies are coming, are interested uh, to come and buy land, come here, buy land, set up factories and produce goods, employ people and produce goods which are exported. All right? and also some of which are sold in the country. All right? This is direct foreign investment. Direct foreign investment has, you know, brings in enormous benefits to the country because it increases, boosts our national income. It uh, gives employment to several people. It expands markets and is all around, is to the all round benefit of the country which is receiving this finance, direct finance, uh, direct foreign investment. But there is also uh, foreign investment that goes into the share market, market for shares. This is, uh, there, there are funds, you know, in uh, uh, America and Europe, as I had mentioned in a previous lecture, there are the proportion of populations of the seniors, that, that is the, the proportion of people in the older age groups is much higher than the proportion of the young population in the total population. As a consequence, these older people have got their pensions after, you know, they have retired and they have got their pensions. They want to invest in you know, invest in safe companies so they get interest or profits or what have you. And this pension money has fueled a whole lot of uh, financial firms whose interest is to look for, you know, all over the world or nowadays, you know, at the click of a button, you can, uh, if your government permits you, you can invest in any company in the world, which is, which are in the, you know, which are being traded in this, in the, uh, <coughs> in the country's uh, st exchange, stock exchanges. Now, they, there are specialist firms that have come up, specialist uh, financial advisors who have come up whose main job is to, you know, invest in this share market, all right? And also, there's also another uh, uh, market called the derivatives market. In India also, they have opened it. I will explain this to you subsequently. They, they, they invest money in the share market. And, uh, you know, the share market prices, that is the price of shares, not, I'm not talking about the dividends. Of course, the price of shares is, is related to the performance of the given company. But of course, may, you know, when the share value, which is the share price can go up or down, it's quite 
uh, quite often it's uh, you know share prices are volatile because even small political events you know can lead to big fluctuations for instance there was uh, you know the report that there was a big scandal in the punjab national bank uh, <coughs> yesterday in the newspapers it resulted in um, you know huge scandal of course huge, huge scam they suspect that uh, <coughs> that uh, nearly <coughs> eight, you know 8500 crores of rupees have been swindled by certain you know people by through through um, you know shady transactions but the moment the you know the news broke out the shares of not only that bank went down the shares of all the other banks because the pan the uh, uh, as the news spread the, the panic spread also because that company this bank might have had transactions with other banks or the persons involved in you know who have opened these accounts in their in these banks have also you know transactions in other banks they may, they may also have done it so their shares come down uh, you know all of a sudden precipitously so as a result what happens is that you know there is a lot of fluctuation in the share market you know which is not related to the real strength of these banks or the real performance criteria that the that uh, these firms and banks have done you you, you may be a very good uh, enterprise you know be you may be an honest enterprise but uh, it may so happen that uh, these uh, fluctuations may hit your company in for instance you are producing you know a particular steel alloy and uh, you know it's uh, and you are making you know you are uh, you are producing it efficiently your costs are low and you are uh, <clears throat> having a big profit margin you the company is look, looking forward you know to you know has received several new orders and so on but all of a sudden if the <coughs> share prices in the steel market comes down for the fault of somebody else or there is some crisis in another country all right the shares of steel prices come down and you the, the share prices of your company also comes down and with the result what happens is when the share value of your company comes down your ability to you know borrow money and invest in a new projects suffer and uh, and people who have who have invested shares in you you know or they they will start uh, selling off their shares then that means that uh, you will your company will be <coughs> pushed into a downward cycle you know uh, <coughs> a downward spiral so the point is that Uh, this is this is all because of the flow of financial funds but they, wait a minute there is another thing that these financial fund financial corporations are expert in doing this investment banks and others are experts in doing they are able to you know that that's a very important thing we should you know they adopt methods of accounting you see in uh, max weber the uh, very great sociologist of economic life he has written about um, the origins of capitalism in europe he you know uh, i don't have to go into he has written this famous book protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism he said that one of the hallmarks of capitalism is that it is based on uh, a set of rational ethic it is ethical because it has it uses the accountant the accounting technique called the balance sheet the balance sheet is supposed to reveal you know very methodically you know it accounts for all the activities of the particular enterprise and is able to determine whether the uh, the for the firm is making profit or losses all right this is ethical practice but now there are accountants who can use the balance sheet 
not to reveal, but to hide. Hide practices, hide uh, you know practices which are illegal or you know tend to fall in the area in the gray area of you know between being illegal or you know, semi-legal. So the point is these account accountants practice are uh, uh, and also these accountants are very innovative. I will give you the an example of how they work and uh, this is uh, this refers to the 2008 um, this thing, uh, sub, what is called subprime crisis in, in the USA, all right. What is interesting about this crisis, this subprime crisis is the, you know, is a subprime loans crisis in America, which affected the whole world. Many people say this was because of governmental intervention in um, forcing commercial banks to give uh, loans uh, to people who uh, to people who are not rich enough to repay uh, and that too these loans were given at low rates of interest uh, what do people do you know they these uh, loans were extended to uh, people to buy houses on mortgages that is the you buy a house you want to buy a house you enter into negotiations with the with the seller of the house and uh, you don't have the entire capital to pay but what you do is you enter into a you know agreement with the bank that the bank pays you know the loan to the company the entire loan to the seller all right and then takes in installments, in monthly installments or weekly installments, what have you, who, you know, with interest from the person who has bought this, uh, you know, who, who is living in that house. Once the loan is cleared by the, by the buyer, then the bank transfers the property papers to the name of the buyer, all right. Now several poor people, you know, entered into mortgage transactions to buy houses for themselves. And because they were, you know, many were poor, they, you know, subsequently reneged on, you know, returning the, uh, the loans, the installments. But be that as it may, now the banks, you know, got hold of these, of these mortgage papers. What they did was, that these accountants said, look, I mean, there are people who are high risk, uh, uh, you know, uh, high liabilities, you know, who may not uh, return the, this thing, uh, the loans. And there are also people who are in steady jobs, who are rich, who are rich enough to repay the loans. So what they did was they took these mortgages and mixed them up, blended them into packages so that they can sell them you know so what what is happening is the risk of you know defaulters you know the defaulters reneging on their loans all right is compensated by the by the certainty of those people who are uh, in a position to return the pay the you know installments every month because they are in steady jobs so they make these combinations and they call them, <coughs> they use these combinations to sell it to other companies who are interested in buying these instruments, all right. These are called securities and these and those companies which receive these securities again sliced up these securities and form different, uh, you know, uh, combinations of these securities and then sold it further, you know higher up like that it went on. So as a result what happens is that those people who are transacting, you know, at the third or the fourth or fifth year of these in this bond market, in this market of securities, they have no clue as to what is happening at the ground level, whether these people are repaying their loans or whether they are, uh, you know, 
unable to repay the loans you know they they are una they are unable to catch hold of it many of the co companies which extended the loans many of the financial companies which extended the loans to these uh, to the primary dwellers of these company uh, of these houses many of them might have disappeared all of us you know because they might have closed down because of because they were uh, not profitable but then you know this went on this this market went on and there was a you know because these there were more and more buyers buying these houses at cheap rates uh, at uh, at attractive rates so they the market boomed it was a it was a big bubble was created bubble was created bigger the bubble became bigger and bigger financial bubble became bigger and bigger but the financial bubble be became bigger and bigger they thought that you know the value of this will go up and you know there's a frenzy in the market to buy this you know uh, derivatives and sell it to the next person and make make money you know but all of a sudden when those banks started reporting losses uh, then it recoiled all along the chain and ultimately it so happened that you know the the housing market crashed and this resulted in other sectors of the economy also you know going into depression this because of that you know it also its effects reverberated even in india our export perform there was nobody to buy our exports in america and the world over and so our perform our economic performance also it was suffered so this i am pointing out is the way by which this uh, financial markets function and the manner in which these financial markets function and you know uh, create bubbles and another feature of these bubbles is who will pay for the losses all right this is there was a big company called uh, freddy and mckay i think this com uh, this company had given out given out lent out money to various uh, uh, financiers to uh, this thing uh, to buy these stocks now when the when the market crashed for uh, when when the subprime loans hit uh, when i there would be there were people left you know with uh, paper with securities which they cannot cash the you know who suffers is the people that means that uh, no company can return the loan that that that, that they are taken from the big company freddy and mckay all right uh, it, which it was in the first place which lent this you know which paid made down payments for these houses so as a consequence what happened was that the 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 government said that well you know we will have to bail out this company it is too big uh, too big to fall too big to fall therefore we will have to save them by infusing you know funds into the into this into this financial company which has become uh, uh, become uh, bankrupt so as a result what happens the money of the tax payers had to go to save these people who uh, save the system but in the process of saving the system those who were able to make money and get away they got away all right this is another you know example of the the way in which the structure of the global economy works and you know in india also we have uh, similar cases you know for instance we have what is called uh, uh, npas non performing assets running into several thousand crores uh, these non performing assets are of uh, public sector banks in india you know the public sector banks have given out loans to big companies huge loans to big companies and they have also done one thing when the companies were not able to 
repay the loans, they gave another loan, all right. They asked them to show that they have returned the money, but they gave another bigger loan to the company concerned to, you know, bail them out. Otherwise, the banks will be in trouble, where banks will have to show losses. So, you know, the banks kept on increasing their loan, the loans that they had given to companies which are not in a, which are not efficient come to big players which who are not efficient who are making money now all of a sudden the banks you now uh, the reserve bank has discovered all these you know um, commercial banks are not uh, efficient and uh, you know they they don't have uh, enough capital to you know uh, give out as loans all right now, and not only that, because of this non-performing assets, other companies who are keen on in investing in India don't want to come because there are uh, these loss-making companies which are, uh, you know, performing and they're not, they don't, uh, the trust, they don't have any trust in these companies' uh, performance. So, the government has to bail out these companies, bail out these banks, public sector banks and uh, they are infusing taxpayers money into these banks. Of course, they are insisting on, uh, on the banks to, to recover the loans, but yet the, 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 the government has to come in to save these commercial banks. If you do not save them, uh, these commercial banks are also too big to fall because if you do not save them, the banks will collapse and who ultimately who will suffer? It is the people who have deposited the money because they are commercial banks, they are uh, public sector banks, they thought that their money was safe. Hard earned money of the people are, uh, invest, are uh, put in these banks for paltry interest. And uh, you know, if the banks fail, these, you know, uh, it is ultimately the people who have deposited money in the, these banks are going to suffer and therefore the, the government is compelled to come in and infuse money into these banks and prop them up. So, the point I am trying to make is that there is a big structure of corruption uh, that has emerged. Big, the, the big global uh, economic structure is such that there are loopholes that can be exploited by various, uh, uh, you know, by you know, clever people to milk public resources for, for private gain. Now, there is another thing about these financial markets that the last point I would like to make that is that financial markets you know, deal with money, right? With money after all is what? Now, money is a currency note, right? It is not gold. Earlier, we used to have gold coins. Now, money is a currency note, printed, printed paper. Now, usually in uh, economic transactions, you use money to sell, you use money, you, you know, you say you are a, you are a farmer, you sell 100, kilo, 100 kilos of rice to get money, so that you can go and get clothes and other things that you need in the market. This is simple. You have certain commodity, you end up, you have one commodity C1, you end up buying C2, C3 and C4 commodities, all right. Actually, money is just a medium of exchange here, all right? It is just a medium of exchange. Now, very soon in the market, when acti activities become more and more brisk, what happens is it appears as if money is exchanged for commodities and commodities are exchanged for more money. M1 will be more money will be profit, all right. Uh, how do they make profit? I do not want to go into that right now. It is said that in the first, when a laborer goes to the, gets a wage from capital, from the capitalist, you know, 
he is not he is given a wage which is lower than the amount of production he yields by working with the machines in the company that is the surplus he creates which should be his that surplus you know that the capitalist you know uses to make more money this is called exploitation now the point is that very soon the market becomes you know it looks as if in the market you are investing money to buy one commodity like let's say in um, i mean you know in the futures market i am not interested in buying uh, you know one ton of wheat all right but uh, i know that the price of wheat will go up all right in um, when the because i know that uh, there is you know uh, next next year will be a, a drought year so if i wait with these shares after all these shares are paper money you know paper you know so if i keep these shares or they are not even paper now they are digital they are on your computer all right you can you know buy and sell on the computer digitally so you you have got these shares all right for the purchase of one ton of wheat all right now you that means the that one ton of wheat in is in your possession all right uh, theoretically if you sell the share if you want to you can convert the share into uh, wheat but who uh, why do i require one ton of wheat all right so i'll wait for an opportune time to sell this share you know and uh, in, in the market when i know that the uh, that the uh, that the uh, wheat in the market is going to be of short in short supply the price of wheat goes up and therefore the share price of this uh, wheat also goes up so i can sell the share and make money so what am i doing i'm just trading in money i'm make i'm using money to make more money and this creates a an empire of desire the financial financialization of the economy is actually financialization is like you know usually it you know the dog it's the dog that wags the tail now the tail used used to be the banks and other things other institutions financial institutions which used to support the dog that's the economy now it's the tail that wags the dog that is the financial companies which wag the which shake up the uh, the real economy so uh you see the all that i want to say is this this craze for money to you know using money to make more and more money this builds up a kind of you know money there's something magical about it it builds up in uh, in people is just for you know go on, go on making more and more money you know desire for making more and more money so much so it becomes a crazy you know the entire edifice we have is an empire of desire empire of greed that's what is become you see unfortunately the feature the one last point i want to make is that the that earlier when i i did, i studied uh, 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 you know indian entrepreneurs from a phd thesis in 19 in the 1970s successful entrepreneurs uh, used to say tell me that uh, at, uh, when they become successful they used to go you know they used to uh, take less interest in uh, their own company they used to just about maintain their company and they used to turn their interest to religious activities to you know encouraging you know sports to you know um, all kinds of charitable you know is they used to divert money to charitable institutions to build schools you know for the poor people and all that because they wanted to gain social esteem they were not they said ab bas itna kar diya हम तो खुश है हमारे पांच पीढ़ियों के लिए हम हमारे पास पैसा है हम क्यों मेहनत करना बट टूडे जनरेशन ऑफ ऑन्टरप्रन्यूर्स आर नॉट लाइक दैट दे वॉन्ट टू मेक कीप ऑन मेकिंग मनी एंड मोर एंड मोर मोर मनी 
we know is also because of the anxiety for making money they have. That is it.